I will try to do a general introduction to FMI technology, just give an overview on the uh, what and why, um, and different flavors, and also uh, look a little bit into the future. Um, there's two main flavors of FMI, FMI for model exchange and FMI for co-simulation. I will talk a little bit about the tools that are available and the process that is in place to ensure interoperability, because that's the main point of the standard. And I'll have a very brief outlook on what is going to happen with FMI version 2 um, that will be released in the pretty near future. There's a release candidate out now that is under testing and investigation. So what's the be motivation behind FMI? Um, we have in model-based systems engineering is in some sense still a, a fairly young uh, method of doing systems engineering and in terms of interoperability we are really at the beginning of things and the technology is evolving rap rapidly new things are coming up and in particular when we are looking at a fully integrated simulation of a system and uh, validation also of control system of the fully integrated systems. So <coughs> one of the things that has been in the way to achieve this in terms of uh, systems engineering is really the lack of standards and standardized interfaces. Very often when you come into the situation that you have two tools that you need to make to work together, then you feel like this picture on the, in the lower right, things just don't match. Yeah? You are with an American connector in Europe and there's no electricity, there's no juice for you. Things just don't match up. <coughs> so what does that lead to? It really leads to inefficiencies in processes in systems engineering. You ha we have to do rework. A model has been done in one tool, it's needed in another tool, there's no interface. And what do people do? They re-implement the same thing in the other tool. And because there's a lack of time, they do it sloppily or they do it simplified. They don't do it as well as it could be done. So there is a, actually a process from manufacturing that's called value stream mapping. Where, where do things go wrong? Where is extra work in processes? And if we look at these processes in systems engineering, I think it's pretty clear that missing or fragile interfaces are part of most troubles in getting processes efficient and, and fast to work. So <coughs> we don't want to end up in this situation that uh, the, as an engineer that the, pro the system that we are working on comes into the next edition of this book. Uh, it's about uh, epic systems engineering failures, a very interesting read, uh, in particular for non-technicians. I got this recommended by uh, an economist, by the way. It's a good book for non-technicians to understand about what can go wrong in systems engineering. Okay, now let's look at the problem in a little bit more detail, in particular from the point of view of somebody that's a system integrator and needs a whole system to work. So the models of different parts, uh, mechanics, controls, thermal parts, have been developed using different modeling and simulation environments, and the system integrator is uh, tasked with uh, trying to get that to work together. So he wants to simulate the complete system and the different programs have to interact with each other. And that's an issue in particular when you have many different tools because you need uh, n-squared interfaces if n is the number of tools if you don't have a standard. And that looks much better if you do have a standard, a standard interface. and. Uh, I give a little bit of history background that's not on the slide here. Um, this came around, uh, maybe around 2008. Uh, a European research project was started and initiated mostly by automotive OEM with Daimler as one of the main driving forces behind it, but many others joining. Um, the project was called Modelisar to bring together um, Modelica as a modeling standard and Autosar as a automotive standard uh, for interfacing on the, in the controls um, arena. 
since then, it has actually changed uh, stewardship. And by now, the Modelica Association is taking care of the FMI project. And there is an FMI steering group. And the Modelica Association um, has reorganized to accommodate uh, projects under different steering groups. So FMI now has its own steering group, which is, consists of vendors and actually industrial power users in order to make sure that requirements are well met. And this group is um, taking care of the standard and moving it forward. So with this standard interface, uh, the idea is that we have um, different units that comply to the standards. They are called FMUs, a functional mock-up unit. Um, and inside the FMU, uh, IP inside it is protected. It's a compiled model, and it can be deployed to third parties. It can be deployed inside the company. So the goal of the FMI project uh, in the Modelic Association is to, to bring together uh, in an open simulation infrastructure, physical system models, whole systems, component models of physical systems, controller models, controller hardware, and controller software. And the idea is that there is um, all of these uh, models or the real software are um, encapsulated and in, in a DLL and in this complete uh, FMI interface that I will talk about a little bit more. Um, so one of the big areas is to improve the interaction between plant modeling and control software development on all of the areas of model in the loop, software in the loop, and hardware in the loop developments, where you want to bring together controller hardware, controller software, and good plant models. The second uh, point of FM FMI is really tool interoperability. So if you look at a, at a large system, you can have um, many different tools that are involved in order to, to bring everything together. You can have um, a multi-body tool to model the chassis. You can have a specialized hydraulics tool to model the hydraulic system that's actuating the brakes. And in the brakes, you can look at a much higher level of detail looking at the tire and the brakes and the brake disc, for example, with finite element analysis. And to bring these things together is actually very often a pain. And the idea of FMI is to really relieve this interoperability pain. The third point, and I think that's really one of the most important ones. I mean, I think all of us who work with model-based development know that developing models is actually a very labor-intensive and, and costly uh, thing. So what we want to achieve with FMI to make it much easier to deploy model assets throughout uh, the enterprise and the company. There's very often uh, friction in processes between departments and in particular also between suppliers and OEMs. And a standardized interface and a standardized encapsulated form of a model makes it much easier to reuse these models and bring them to different departments, to bring them to different companies necessary. A supplier can suppl give a plant model to an OEM. Uh, a software, a uh, control software developer can, for example, give an encapsulated model of the software. And the, the, the reuse of these models and efficiencies of the processes will be much improved. OK, I come now from the motivation to the more technical part. I'll talk a bit about what FMUs are. An FMU is a unit that complies to the functional mockup interface. It is a model with a standard interface. And these components we call FMUs, a functional mockup unit. An FMU is divided into two main parts. There is a description of the interface data, which is in an XML file. And the actual functionality can be either C code in order to support hardware in the loop, um, or it can be binary compiled code, depending on really the use case. So the FMU then is a zip file uh, containing the XML description file. 
and the implementation in source or in binary form. Binary is much more common at the moment, but source code is necessary for compilation to specific hardware. Additional data and functionality can be included inside the same uh, FMU. For example, if the model needs data files, uh, they can also reside inside that zip directory and can be used. Information and interface specification of this is available at uh, www.fmistandard.org and I really recommend everybody um, to, to look at that website. I checked, I don't have internet connection here, I wanted to go live on the website because it has very interesting information um, about the available tools and also on the interoperability processes. FMI comes in two variants. Um, there is FMI for model exchange and FMI for co-simulation. Um, both have been released in 2010, so about three years ago now. Um, and we are about to release a, a version two at the end of the year or beginning of next year. And there is one very major difference between these two variants. Uh, in FMI for model exchange, the FMU only contains a model, but the solver to, to move the model forward through time resides in the tool. So it's an interface specification where uh, the right-hand side of the model equations is contained in the FMU, but the solver is in the tool uh, driving this. Um, this is um, similar to S functions in, in Simulink for those people who work with it. Um, the difference is that it's a public standard where both sides of the interface are well documented publicly and accessible to everybody. The second FMI variant is FMI for co-simulation, uh, which reuses as much as possible from FMI for model exchange standard in terms of how, for example, the, the, the metadata about the model is handled, but it's, um, the difference is that the solver moves really from uh, being in the tool into the FMU. And that makes uh, quite an important difference and also very different use cases about um, how, how the FMI standard can be used. So now let's look at um, how um, an FMU is built up. The FMU has these two main parts, a model DLL and a model description file in XML. Um, the model description file references an XML schema, XSD, which is defined by the FMI specification. And that schema makes it possible to very systematically work with all the definitions and the metadata that is contained in the FMU. Um, and it, it gives a lot of um, possibilities to um, do useful and intelligent stuff with the model in the, that, that is compiled into the DLL. So a simulator GUI would read the XML file. A user can interact with that. The GUI controls the solver, and the solver runs one or many FM, um, DLLs or FMUs in, in the model. That is a very rough structure of, of the FMI interface. And um, there's a couple of, of good reasons for the structure. I'll go into more technical detail as we come. Um, <coughs> the idea of uh, XML is a, is a fairly verbose standard, but uh, it's, it's quite structured. And it's easy to deal with um, by tools. Um, so the complex data structures will give a simple interface. You will find inside the XML schema a definition of all information that's related to the model. There's also a C interface. Um, there are C header files which define basic types on the C side. There are C functions which um, contain of 18 core functions, six utility functions, and no macros. There is a particular C function that is um, to address the particular model uh, through the model identifier tag um, inside an FMU. Um, so inside the C interface, there you can instantiate the model. 
This fmi component is then a parameter to the other interface functions, uh, pointer to void, maybe too technical. Functions, there are functions for initialization, termination, and destruction. There is uh, support for real integer, boolean, and string inputs, outputs, and parameters. Setters and getters for all these functions. The C interface allows any kind of interaction that you need to do with a model, with an FMU. So with an FMI for model exchange, you can do import and export of input-output blocks, um, and they are described by differential algebraic discrete equations with time, state, and step events. These M FMUs can be large, so they can be enormously big systems, 100,000 and more variables. But FMUs can also be used in embedded systems, so there's small overhead. That is part of what you get from the separation of the metadata into the XML file and the actual execution and core of the model into the DLL. Um, signals in and out of a model exchange FMU are essentially that you have an enclosing model that contains the FMU uh, that sends inputs U into the model, gets outputs Y out. The solver is separate and um, there is a communication between um, the right-hand side of the model to the solver and the actual values at the next time out from the solver and all variables from the FMU are accessible in the external environment. So usually the interface of an FMU is many orders of magnitude simpler than what is contained in the FMU. Let's now look at uh, the co-simulation part of FMI. We, have, uh, we can couple several simulation tools uh, and each tool treats one part of the modular coupled problem. The advantage is that you can do specific things that, that are for one solver. So you can simulate heterogeneous systems, you can partition and parallelize that system, you can do multi-rate integration and things like that. FMI for co-simulation has a master-slave architecture and um, can take into account different capabilities of simulation tools. An important part is that um, FMI for co-simulation does not define the actual co-simulation algorithm. It only defines the interface that makes it possible to do very good co-simulation algorithms, but they are not part of the standard. They, are, they have to be developed by every tool supporting FMI for co-simulation. But it allows communication technology for distributed scenarios. Signals in a co-simulation FMU are a little bit different. Essentially, we can take an FMU for a model exchange and embed it into an enclosing model so that we remove all the communication between the model and the solver. We now only have inputs and outputs and uh, the, the enclosed thing becomes a co-simulation slave on FMU instance uh, that is opaque where you don't need to and can look into the, the internal and the enclosing model is essentially the co-simulation master. Um, it can be used as a standalone tool or it can be used in a co-simulation tool where you have um, all the integration between different, um, different models on the co-simulation side. We usually have, an, uh, have a wrapper and smart algorithms to drive co-simulation forward. Here is the architecture how this would look for distributed simulation um, where you need um, a communications layer that is separate from uh, the actual models. I've seen actually recently an implementation of that on top of the um, mostly military used HLA standard. Okay, here is a snapshot from the website, the FMI website. I think there are around 35 to 40 tools that support FMA. Uh, the different color blobs on here, they have to do really with a process that the FMI steering committee and group has set up uh, in order to make sure that FMUs really can interoperate. And uh, I want to do some remarks here. Essentially, all tools here should, in the end, have green buttons, because the green buttons show that the tool has um, submitted FMUs for testing and has in integrated into the um, interoperability process. There are cross-checking rules for uh, FMUs, and uh, we actually are lucky to have one of the stewards of this cross-checking process today with us. It's uh, Andreas Jungans from Qtronic, who will also talk later. Um, what is happening there is that 
um, there's several levels of compliance. There's an FMI compliance checker that's uh, provided by the Modelica Association. And that compliance checker checks whether the FMU principally complies to the Modelica standard. But beyond that, you really want to make sure that particular implementations between tools really work together. And for that, we have this cross-checking rules and process where different FMUs uh, are checked from exporters to importers. Exporters provide FMUs in this testing infrastructure, importers import them, and there's an automatic process. This is a mostly automatic process where you can see um, which tools have actually been tested in detail with which other tools. This is work in progress. Lots of things are happening. Um, there's, for example, two empty columns here because I took a snapshot yesterday and new export FMUs have been put into the system that have not yet been checked by importing tools but will in the next round of testing. So this is a very live picture of how interoperability really works. Okay, short outlook to FMI 2. Um, there are significant improvements over FMI Model Exchange 1 and FMI Co-Simulation 1. In particular, there's more harmonization. The specifications are merged. There's in in 2.0, there's only single specification. There's an improved handling of hybrid and discrete models. Um, there's an efficient interface to Jacobian matrices that allows uh, optimization applications to also be integrated with, uh, with the FMI standard. Very interesting from my point of view. Tunable parameters for interactive simulation, they are mostly important for the control development part of FMIs. It allows controller tuning. Okay, summary. Uh, I think FMI has a very high potential of being widely accepted in the CE world. It was initiated, organized, and pushed by Daimler to significantly improve the exchange of models between suppliers and OEMs. Um, it is defined in a close collaboration of different tool vendors, um, which is very useful for interoperability standards. Industrial users uh, were and are involved in, in moving this forward and testing this all the time, and it can be used with many CAU tools. Many Modelica tools, Simulink, multi-body tools, and we will hear more about what tools it's um, uh, been supported by. It's also put supported by a couple of industry groups. There's a global automotive alliance group with more than 15 automotive OEM worldwide. They're really from the US, Europe, and Asia, which are pushing this forward. It's also supported by a standards-driving nonprofit organization, prostep.org, as part of PLM standardization. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, this was uh, as much of an introduction that I c as I could cram into 20 minutes.